is in the description so you can get a sense of what the seminar series is about. All right, so I think with that, uh, we are ready to get into it today. So I'm thrilled to roll out the latest episode of the Quantum Life seminar series dedicated to you, the research and academic quantum communities. Uh, this seminar takes place every Friday at noon Eastern time and will be hosted on this YouTube channel. I'm your host, Slot Kuminev from IBM Quantum Research, and today I have the uh, exceptional treat uh, and privilege of hosting Ivan Deutsch, a Regents Professor, uh, Department of Astronomy and Applied Physics from the University of New Mexico. And hello, Ivan. How are hey, you today? Hi, Good to see you. Good to see you, too. Uh, where are you tuning in from? Oh, I'm here in beautiful Albuquerque, New Mexico. Ah, take me there. <laughs> well, you can see, I don't know if you see my slides now, but you know, there's our skyline, the Sandia Mountains. Uh, it looks just like that out my the door from my uh, townhouse. So <laughs> anyway, uh, it's good to be here. Thank you. It's, it looks like an amazing place. Uh, before we get to your beautiful slides, uh, let me give a bit of background introduction. Um, so, well, I think for one, I can share uh, on, a, on the more personal note that from Ivan, I've learned we both share a profound love of quantum optics and quantum measurement paradoxes or debunking non Hermitian observables and so on. So it's my deep pleasure to welcome Ivan uh, here today. Um, Ivan is also the director of the Center of Quantum Information and Control at the University of New Mexico. He received his bachelor from MIT and his uh, PhD from, in physics from uh, UC Berkeley. Ivan was a postdoc at NIST with Bill Phillips and joined UNM in 1995. Among many accolades, Ivan is a fellow of the American uh, Physical Society, a Fulbright senior scholar, and many others. And as a fun fact, uh, Ivan is the academic grandson of Wheeler and Charlie Towns, and Ephraim is his uh, uh, academic brother, among things. So with that, Ivan, um, we can turn it over to you and pull up your slides. Very good, Slatko. Thank you so much uh, for this invitation and this opportunity to uh, have this conversation uh, with the worldwide community. Uh, it's very, uh, it's a real privilege, and I've enjoyed many of the seminars that have preceded this one. Uh, so I'm going to tell you a little story about uh, quantum computing with neutral atoms. Uh, as Slatko said, I am the director of CQIC. Uh, and if you see now my slides, that's uh, what it looks like in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And I encourage you to at least visit us uh, virtually and hopefully someday quite soon in person. Um, so, I'm, you know, it's an interest, very interesting time we're living in in, in quantum computing. Um, and one thing that's happened, uh, you know, Ion trap quantum computing is something that I think many of the community knows about. It just turned 25 with this groundbreaking paper from Sirac and Zoller uh, talking about how one could achieve. This was just really on the heels of Shor's algorithm. And I would say that Shor's algorithm together with the Sirac Zoller proposal for how one might implement quantum computing with trapped ions really was one of the important events that ignited the quantum computing uh, revolution. And um, you know, just to show you that I'm making my slides at the last minute here, uh, this is some of the chatter that's been on Twitter regarding what's been going on with ion trap quantum computing. Uh, in recently in Nature, just a few days ago, uh, talking about the the quantum computing race intensifying with so-called alternative technology. And this caused quite a stir on, Shitter, on Twitter, the idea that uh, ion traps are alternative uh, <laughs> uh, technology when in fact, uh, you know, doing quantum computing with atoms, in this case, ions uh, um, was arguably one of the very first um, technologies that's now kind of, uh, taking off in the private sector as well. But I'm here to tell you a slightly different story, the story of neutral atoms. So um, I, we just recently moved to a new building and I, I, I dug up, this is a, a picture that this guy here is me. 
uh, back in about the year 2000 with Gavin Brennan and, and Shohini Ghosh and some others from my group uh, where we were back uh, in the late 20th century <laughs> thinking about uh, how we, you know, we were um, inspired by the work in trapped atomic ions and thinking then about what if we use not ions but neutral atoms as the uh, carriers of quantum information. And this is now starting to emerge 20 plus years later uh, as a potential dark horse candidate for the power of quantum computing. Uh, there are a number of startups that are uh, starting up uh, and thinking about how we might implement quantum computing with neutral atoms. Uh, in fact, I, I saw recently Cold Quanta, uh, led by Mark Safman, uh, is now has their, their cloud version um, of their atom uh, processor uh, online. And this, of course, is this work is preceded by tremendous amount of effort all over uh, the world in academic laboratories, uh, some of the real pioneers in the subject, uh, and, and some newcomers that are making some great, great strides. Um, so what I want to tell you about today a little bit, of course, I know that many of you are not necessarily coming from the background of atomic physics or optical physics, is to give you a little sense of, you know, how we got here and where we might be going um, from here. So to do that, um, I want to get started. You know, why atoms? Why would we think about individual atoms as good carriers for quantum information and building a technology for, say, making a quantum computer? And, you know, I'm an AMO chauvinist, uh, a quantum optics chauvinist, so I'll, I'll, I'll tell you that story from that perspective. Um, and I would argue that the world's most quantum coherent device is the atomic clock. Um, an atomic clock is based on qubit technology. Uh, that is to say, being able to control coherence uh, between two levels of two energy levels of an atom. And the standard is currently still based on cesium at a microwave frequency in a microwave cavity to control uh, the uh, coherence between two hyperfine states of, of, of cesium. And more recently, great strides are being made controlling coherence between two energy levels that are separated by uh, at an optical frequency, making incredible strides in terms of our precision. So precision metrology and the technology that developed over many decades in metrology really lies at the foundation of quantum uh, technologies today, including quantum computing. Um, so, uh, you know, an atomic clock, you would say, is an ensemble of non-interacting qubits. But if we want to make a quantum computer, we want to be able to go from our tremendous ability to control single qubits in an ensemble to directly controlling the many-body wave function of a collection of many atoms. And in order to get there, there were a number of steps that needed to take uh, to happen to, to enable us to do that. And so I want to just tell you a few uh, of the back, a little bit of the background that got us here. One thing that's important is we need to be able to not just have a cloud of atoms, but we need to be able to trap individual atoms and address the individual atoms if they are going to be the carriers of the qubits. And there was real pioneering work out of Philippe Granger and Antoine Barre's group out in Paris going back oh, 20 years about as well uh, in a so-called optical tweezer where you can then see an individual atom and know you had it and then be able to manipulate it. 
And similar kind of work out of Dave Weiss's group in so-called optical lattices, 3D crystals, where one can then manipulate and those, that crystal and look at each individual atom and image it. Um, and in recent years, and I should uh, maybe make the one caveat here, I'm not going to be referencing uh, every, all the works. There is quite a bit of it, and uh, so I'm not going to be giving a, a comprehensive bibliography, but everyone, anyone is welcome to ask me, and I'm, I'll tell you about that uh, in questions or afterwards. In any event, uh, there's been some big technological advances in recent years, in the last, I'd say within the last five years, of taking those abilities to trap individual atoms and then manipulate them in such a way that we could get a deterministic crystal perfectly filled in, a, in, a, in, in patterns that we like work in 1D at Michel Lukin's lab and being able to then in this middle uh, plot, what I'm showing you is one, well, when one traps these atoms, you either get one or zero because if two atoms get into the trap, they collide and they explode out of the trap. But then one can see where those atoms are and by manipulating the optical trap, one can move those atoms around with a series of moves to create other patterns in either 2D or even 3D. Here's a cute picture of uh, a collection of atoms trapped in the Eiffel Tower. So there's a tremendous technological advance in trapping that's been quite important. But another important uh, advance that we need is Although an atomic clock controls the coherence within a single qubit, we know to make a quantum computer, we need to do quantum logic between qubits, which means we need well-controlled entangling interactions between atoms. Now, in an ion trap, that happens very naturally through the strong Coulomb interaction that happens between ions, but neutrals don't interact that strongly. That makes them good in a way that, because you can get lots of qubits, hundreds, maybe thousands of qubits, where that would be very hard to do with ions. But then you got to make them interact with one another in a coherent manner to create the entanglement to do the quantum logic you want to do. And there have been kind of two different approaches that people have looked at over the years. Atoms in their ground state, of course, are very weakly interacting. The van der Waals interaction is tiny. Uh, and you have to get the atoms very, very close together for them to be able to interact and, uh, and entangle with one another. And that's been uh, the story of many interesting quantum uh, technology experiments, particularly in quantum simulations of cold atomic gases, the so-called atomic gas microscope which allowed uh, those kinds of experiments to really to, to take off. Um, but those are hard to control interactions. On the other hand, if we keep the atoms far apart from one another, as in those optical tweezer type experiments, then we need some kind of longer range interactions. And we can do that by exciting atoms into excited states where then they have stronger electric dipole-dipole interactions. And in particular, one of the important uh, knobs that we have to tune is by using lasers to coherently excite atoms to very highly excited orbitals, so-called Rydberg states, which have very high principal quantum numbers. Then the atoms are extremely polarizable they can have extremely large van der Waals interactions or even resonant dipole-dipole interactions. And those interaction energies scale hugely with the principal quantum number. So if we can excite an atom up into a highly excited orbital, then those atoms will can interact and entangle with one another. And after that entanglement happens, coherently put the atoms back in their ground state, 
where they're no longer interacting with one another. So that's a real powerful uh, knob here. Um, so what I'm plotting over here is showing what the energy levels look like roughly for two atoms in the ground state, one atom excited into the Rydberg state, R here is denoting a Rydberg energy level. And we get this very big uh, splitting of the energy levels due to, say, dipole-dipole interactions. Now this, um, you know, sort of on the heels of our original proposal for using electric dipole-dipole interactions for making quantum logic, uh, a paper, uh, including Sirach and Zoller and others, uh, took that a step further, thinking about it using these very strong dipole-dipole interactions with Rydberg states. And the sort of what we now call the sort of the standard protocol for entangling neutral atoms uh, based on uh, Rydberg interactions comes from this paper now uh, 20 years ago. Uh, based on what was called the Rydberg blockade or the dipole blockade. And the basic idea here is that if we have an atom and we excite this atom from its ground state up to the Rydberg state, say this is the control atom, the target atom, if I now try to excite it to the Rydberg state, because of the strong dipole-dipole interaction, it is blockaded. It's so far off resonance that this atom won't get excited. And that um, kind of interaction you can intuit is a way of doing quantum logic. The target atom cannot be excited conditioned on the state of the control atom. Now, there are some challenges to creating, you know, that was 20 years ago, September 2000 when we were all very naive, pre-9-11, pre-meltdown of the, of the financial system, pre-COVID-19. Boy, those are the days, <laughs> my friend. Um, uh, why, why haven't, you know, we don't, where's, where's my neutral atom quantum computer? Well, there are some challenges to making this work well. Um, there are some fundamental limitations when the atom is in the excited state, it has a finite lifetime. So you got to do the gate before the atom decays back to a lower energy level. But that's a long lifetime and there's plenty of time to do that. But there's some, you know, there's been technical problems. You know, I'm an experiment. I'm, I'm a theorist. I only play an experimentalist on TV. Uh, as, as I like to say, I was Bill Phillips' first and last theory postdoc. Um, but I did learn a little bit about experiments. And one of the things, you know, making lasers work well is hard. Um, there are some other sort of, I would say, more design issues, you know, protocol dependent. For these atoms are trapped, but they're not at zero temperature. They're moving around in the trap. They're neutral. They're not as strongly trapped as the ions. And that can cause random phases, Doppler shifts, in homogeneity. And this idea of the Rydberg blockade is never perfect because even though the atom might be off resonant to excitation, it's still a finite probability to excite. So one of the things that we've been doing in my group in collaboration with many others is thinking about what are the ways to make the best high fidelity gates for quantum logic. So that's what we seek to do, make robust gates. So um, what I'm going to tell you about is a particular idea. And the idea, let me build up some of the pedagogy for how we're going to do that. So firstly, you know, the way I just described it in the fundamental or the, 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 um, the standard protocol is you have a separate control and target atom that you address with laser beams separately. That has its own issues. Let's suppose that we're going to address both of these atoms together with one laser beam that doesn't tell the difference between these two atoms. So in that case, we, I'm going to think about this symmetrically. 
and think about these two atoms where I'm looking here, a ground state and an excited Rydberg state. The atoms are separated by some distance. If I look at this in the two atom basis, then I can think about this as a kind of three level system where I only think about the symmetric states, right? The anti-symmetric state is not coupled. It's dark to this symmetric coupling of the two laser beams. And because of that, I have this sort of super radiant different coupling where big omega here is the Rabi frequency that tells me about the strength of coupling. In the two atom case, the coupling between two atoms in the ground state and this bright state has this factor of square root of two in it. Now, because of the dipole-dipole interaction, if this were perfectly blockaded, then really what I have now is a two-atom, two-level system in which I would get Rabi oscillation between both atoms in the ground state and this entangled state. And in some fundamental work done uh, out of, uh, uh, originally out of Mark Safman and, and Antoine Braway's group, they demonstrated this kind of uh, entangling interactions. Uh, this date is not correct. I think that should be 2011. So you can see how the Rydberg blockade, uh, in this case, creates entangling interactions in a different way through this symmetric coupling. Now, we want to do this in a robust manner. And the way we're going to do that is based on off-resonant excitation, so-called dress states. So instead of exciting the atom directly in a raw, in a, in a, some say a pi pulse up to the Rydberg state, I'm going to imagine an off-resonant uh, kind of excitation. In which case, I'm going to not think about uh, these so-called bare states, but the dress states. The dress states are superpositions of these two states that are the eigenstates of the combined atomic energy levels and the atom-laser interaction. And those dress states are in some, this E should be an R, excuse me, another typo over here. They're superpositions that depend on how far off resonant I am and how strong, what's my intensity or Rabi frequency that describes it. This little theta is sort of the, the, the mixing or the superposition parameter. And if I were to adiabatically change this parameter, say the detuning, sweep the detuning, then I would say go, if I swept from the red side, my dress state would adiabatically follow. This is what we call adiabatic passage. I would adiabatically transfer the atom from its ground state to the Rydberg state. And right in the middle, right on resonant, I would have a 50-50 superposition of the ground in the Rydberg state. And this shift is what we would call the light shift, the shift of the atom uh, due to its interaction with the light or the laser beam. Okay. Now, that was for a single atom. Suppose I have two atoms, and those two atoms are symmetrically coupled. If I have a perfect blockade, as I just described, then I have a new two-level system, a two-level system between the ground state and the bright state, the entangled bright state, okay, with the square root of two in the Rabi frequency due to the so-called super radiant effect. I will have, again, dress states, but there's two atom dress states dressing the ground state with this entangled state. And once again, I would have a light shift, a two atom light shift. That's what this uh, delta E is. It's the energy eigenvalue that is the shift of my two atom state in the presence of this laser beam, okay? Now, this is different from the twice the one atom light shift. It's different because the atoms are interacting. 
So this dashed line is what the twice the light shift of the non-interacting atoms would be, what we just showed before. And the deficit or the difference between twice the one atom light shift and the two atom light shift is what we're calling the entangling strength. It's the entangling energy that these two atoms experience as I adiabatically dress them. Okay? Now, how big is that energy? How big is kappa? Well, um, it depends how far off resonance I am, and it depends on what the Rabi frequency is. So this is a complicated expression depending on both the detuning and the Rabi frequency. And it scales quite differently if I'm far off resonance than when I'm on resonance. This kappa, this, diff this deficit, which is the strength of the entanglement that I'm getting, scales quite differently. It's, it falls off very rapidly if I'm far off resonance, but it's very strong. It could be as strong as on the order of the Rabi frequency, which can be many megahertz, for those of you who like megahertz, uh, which gives you a, a sense of what the uh, energy scale or how fast the entanglement gate would be in this case. Okay, so the use of adiabatic dressing is no, well known in the AMO community as a way of doing robust control. For example, uh, in the AMO community, the ability to make cold molecules by taking two atoms and sweeping adiabatically onto an energy level where the atoms become bound as a molecule has been uh, a very powerful tool. It's a tool that's used all the time uh, in coherent spectroscopy, particularly in AMO physics. And we want to leverage that for doing robust gates, okay? And we, I want to show you how such a process would then allow us to make gates that can be more robust to the, these, the uh, thermal motion of atoms in the trap and potential uh, inhomogeneities in the laser intensity and the Doppler shifts that would give me an inhomogeneous tuning. Now, when people think about adiabatic, Often, you uh, yeah, uh, question. Yeah, thank you, Ivan. Just a quick clarification question. I think you've mm -hmm. basically said it, but but maybe to help out uh, the folks in the super, from coming yep. from a superconducting background, uh, the way that all of the detuning is done here is is by varying or ch the frequency of or chirping the the lasers and the atoms uh, frequencies. Otherwise, that is energy correct. splittings always stay so, constant. So you know uh, the. There are, of course, potential background fields that can be a technical problem, right? So these atoms, it's like, you know, as you know, there's an intrinsic conflict in quantum computing. You want your qubits to interact strongly with one another, but very weakly with anything else. And when you excite an atom to a very highly excited Rydberg state, it's highly polarizable, which means if there are stray electric fields, you're in trouble. Uh, and so, you know, the shift of the energy level of the atom is a technical problem, but one that, you know, the folks in the lab know how to control as best they can. Um, but the way the, uh, we're going to shift the detuning, say, go through this avoided crossing is by chirping, as you say, the laser frequency. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thank you. And moreover, what I was just about to say is when you think about adiabatic, you think slow. But, you know, there's something we call adiabatic rapid passage. So it's got to be adiabatic in the sense that it's got to be slow compared to the gap. 
but rapid compared to spontaneous emission or other uh, inhomogeneous broadening. And the question is, can this be fast on a scale that we care about? And the answer is yes. So as you just suggested, Slotko, the idea here is that we're going to adiabatically chirp the uh, laser frequency and in doing so move the atom uh, on, a, on this dress state at which point depending upon its energy level if I have an atom in the logical one state or two atoms in the logical one state I will uh, be able to chirp that atom and it will pick up a phase okay now, there's a lot of technical details here, so I'm actually going to skip over some of them because I want to, uh, it gets a little bit complicated. But let me just basically explain the idea here. So we're going to have a qubit, a qubit with a logical zero and a logical one. The logical zero is not going to be affected by the laser. It's going to be way off resonance. It's a lower energy level, and the logical one is an excited qubit in excited hyperfine, but still in the electronic ground state. And depending upon the logical state, the atom will move along one of these curves and pick up a phase, a dynamical phase that depends on the energy level adiabatically moving as a function of time. And the point here is that when both atoms are in the logical one, I have an additional energy here that's due to the entanglement, this extra factor kappa that's coming from the dipole-dipole interaction. Okay, so um, how can we make a quantum logic gate out of that? Well, the idea is in the logical basis, we pick up a phase. And we can, for example, make a controlled phase gate, one that's familiar perhaps to many of the viewers here as a, a matrix in the logical basis where I pick up a minus one on one of the logical basis states and the other logical basis states pick up nothing, right? And that additional phase is coming from here uh, this um, uh, entangling interaction. There are other kinds of entangling gates. You know, uh, you may, some of you from potentially the trapped ion community or people who have just studied quantum computing know about the Momer Sorensen gate. The Momer Sorensen gate was invented for by Momen and Sorensen as a gate in ion traps uh, that was robust against motion of ions thermal motion of ions in the trap and has a different form. One of the things, if you look at this matrix as an operator, the momer sorensen gate is a pure entangler. It involves this collective spin operator S, which is the, you know, the sum of the two Pauli matrices of the two qubits squared. Whereas, so, you know, the CZ the, the, the controlled knot, or the con I'm sorry, the controlled Z gate actually has a part that's a single qubit. It, you may not have ever seen it in this form, but this is actually what the unitary operator looks like relative to the collective spin operators. Now, why am I telling you this? Well, we want to make this gate with the adiabatic dressing. And we want to make this robustly. There may be a variation in the entangling phase, which is coming from some kind of inhomogeneity. The atomic motion would give us some shift in the phase that we don't want. And that would lead to an infidelity. What I'm writing here is the fidelity, which is the overlap between the target unitary operator we want to make and the one we actually implemented. And that fidelity is going to fall off from one depending on what these 
shifts are, these delta thetas, which are shifts in the light shift coming from the single atom effect and shifts from the two atom effects. And if we look at how that gate infidelity, what it looks like, for as we go away from perfect fidelity, it falls off very rapidly if we have inhomogeneity coming from the two atom light shift. I'm sorry, from the one atom light shift. This red curve here is I keep the two atom light shift in homogeneity at zero, but then I see how the fidelity drops due to one atom effects. And I see it drops much faster due to the one atom light shift than if I kept the two atom light shift fixed and looked at inhomogeneity coming from uh, the two atom light shift. So what this says, if I can cancel this effect, I can get a much more robust, a much more flat curve here, which would be a perfect fidelity, perfect fidelity gates at fidelity one. And so by doing what many of you would might be familiar with, a so-called spin echo sequence, whereby I interleave my chirping of the laser. This little blue curve says I'm going to turn on and off the laser, both in its intensity and its frequency, and interleave that with an echo sequence, then I can make a very robust gate. And that's one of the things we've done. We've, we've done some simulations. The idea here is that we would turn on both the intensity and we would turn on chirp the frequency of the laser, the detuning of the laser, leave it on for a little bit, and then turn it back off, and we will adiabatically sweep in and out of resonance. And what we have shown in that manner is that we can create very high entangling gates, gates with, we expect, at least two nines, maybe three nines of fidelity, depending upon the lifetime of the atom in its Rydberg state. And this is work that we are currently working on in collaboration with Grant Biederman, uh, who's current University of Oklahoma, who's done some of the pioneering work on Rydberg dressing, demonstrating its proof of principle for creating entanglement, but we now think we can make some of the highest fidelity gates and be competitive with what's going on uh, in the world of ion traps. So I'm gonna pause for one moment here to see if there are any questions about this because I have a slightly different topic to share with you as well. So Zlatko, are there any comments, questions? Yeah, if uh, folks have questions, please uh, put them in the comment chat box and then I'll try to get them to Ivan. Uh, well, we can also take questions uh, at the end of the talk as well. Absolutely. Uh, I think we are um, good on this. You've, you've explained it really well. Thank you. All right. Well, um, I'll, I'll look forward to more questions at the end. Uh, let me maybe in a uh, next 10 minutes, five to 10 minutes, tell you where we, some of the ways, places we might go from here and when some of the uh, interesting things we can do uh, given our capacity to control uh, these kinds of atoms. In particular, what I wanna talk about is quantum computing beyond qubits, okay? so. Um, you know, we often talk about qubits and most of the work we do in thinking about quantum computing is based on qubits. Um, but what if we wanted to go beyond qubits, so-called qubits, uh, systems with more than two levels, thinking about 
uh, D level systems. Why might we do that? Um, well, there are some potential advantages. If we have D level systems, then we can encode more information in fewer physical systems. Okay. And there's some ideas of where we had that we might be able to improve algorithmic efficiency and even have a potentially improved um, tolerances for uh, in, you know, making fault tolerant quantum computers. Okay. Now, of course, nothing is a free lunch. Uh, there are lots of potential disadvantages of doing uh, things with qubits rather than qubits. I mean, the, the improvement in, in storage is only really logarithmic, but you know, for, as I was showing here, if we wanted to say factor the largest possible number, it's over a thousand uh, qubits, but 300 say D, uh, 10 level systems. So we would have a factor of three and a factor of three ain't nothing. Uh, but it is only logarithmic. Um, readout would be much more challenging with qubits. We'd have to not, it's easier to read out a yes or no answer than it is to read out D different possible levels of a system. We'd have to think about that carefully. And we also need to think about how we're going to do quantum logic with the level system. So instead of for with thinking about qubits, we think about universal logic as arbitrary SU2 plus one uh, entangling gate. For D-level systems, we'd have to think about SUD. And in thinking about SUD, we want to think about, for example, the generalizations of Pauli Z and Pauli X. Here they are. Uh, Pauli Z, if I think about a computational basis set, uh, that should actually be D minus one, uh, this final one, there are D-levels here. They would pick up a root unity phase for the Z gate and a um, X would be the shift that would shift you mod D from the level K to the level K plus one mod D. So these are the QDIT generalizations of the Pali X and Pali Z. So what I want to tell you about is how we make those gates uh, in uh, some interesting technology with neutral atoms. And what I want to tell you about is, you may remember from the beginning of my talk, I talked about two kinds of atomic clocks. There was the cesium atomic clock, and that was the idea, that, oh, what I just told you about, storing the qubit in the cesium-like levels, the two levels of the microwave clock. And then there was the atomic clock based on optical clocks. And they are, for example, built on the atom strontium. And strontium uh, is a group two element. It has two valence electrons. So its ground state uh, is, has uh, a total angular momentum zero. It has zero uh, orbital angular momentum, L equals zero and the two electrons are paired in a singlet. And so in crazy uh, atomic physics spectroscopic notation, the ground state of strontium is a singlet S0. Um, it has a nuclear spin. And that if I'm in the isotope strontium-87, the nuclear spin has spin nine halves. So this gives us an opportunity to encode a Q decimal, a 10 level Q dit in the nuclear spin, say, of strontium. And we can control them, for example, with magnetic interactions. If we put on a magnetic field, the nuclear spin would interact with that. We can get, say, a Zeeman shift between the nine, I'm sorry, the 10 magnetic sublevels of. Uh, the, the nuclear spin of strontium 
And then we can say manipulate that with NMR, with spin resonance. Now, if we did that, we would only have Larmor precession. We would have SU2, but not SUD. So how are we going to do that? Well, on the right here, I'm showing this very complicated energy level structure of strontium, whereby I can excite with a variety of laser beams to different excited states. And in particular, there are these states here, which are spin triplet. Spin triplet are forbidden. I can't go from a singlet to a triplet with a laser beam. And those are called the, the intercombination lines in atomic jargon. They're the basis of these long lived states, the atomic clocks. But they're not exactly triplet. They have a little bit of singlet mixed in, which means I can excite a little bit to these levels up here. OK, so I want to be able to use that as and to do control. So to do that, I'm going to go beyond SU2 controllability and um, talk about the theory of geometric control. What we need is we need the ability to manipulate with control fields putting in a collection of Hamiltonians that allow us to synthesize an arbitrary unitary interaction on our qubit. And based on the theory of Lie groups, we can do that. We can do that if we have access to a series of Hamiltonians that are generators of the Lie algebra of the group of interest. And what geometric controllability tells us is that if these Hamiltonians generate the Lie algebra, then there exists a set of control waveforms, these lambdas, and a total time of interaction such that the time evolution operator is equal to any target unitary in the group. OK, so um, once that's an existence thing, once we have controllability, then we can numerically search for controls that do the job. OK, so in particular, what we're going to do is um, use the laser field that is tuned at some way to make to go beyond SU2 control to increase our control to have something that allows a nonlinear rotation. And when we excite the atom in this region, then we can, in addition to the SU2 control that we had, we can uh, go and have an additional term here that makes a generator of the system that allows us to make an SU2 for an arbitrary D, for an arbitrary spin. Okay, so the idea here is through a combination of magnetic interactions and excitations to an excited state, I should be able to make an arbitrary QDIT logic gate. So let me conclude by showing you how that's done. So once again, let me just say what the, the idea here is. We have these magnetic interactions we have the, what we're going to control is the phase of our RF feed, Fable. So we're going to put on an RF magnetic field. That RF field has a Larmor precession frequency, and it has a phase of oscillation. Okay, excuse me. That phase of oscillation is what we are going to 
uh, determine through optimal control in order to drive the um, particular gate we want to do. And the way we're going to do that is by making that phase piecewise constant. We're going to have a series of phases. We have a, then a, we got to search for this vector of phases that does the job. And we're going to optimize the fidelity. We're either going to optimize the fidelity that gets us to a, a target superposition state that we want, or we're going to optimize the fidelity that makes a particular gate we want. We do that by a gradient ascent, which tells us that by starting with some random seed for the phases of the RF field as a function of time, we optimize one of these target fidelities. And by just numerically searching, we can optimize and find something which gets us a fidelity that's near one. OK, so let's just conclude by showing you how that's done, just as an example. So here we are. Let's say we have prepared our atom in one of the magnetic sublevels. What I'm showing you here is a goal. Suppose my goal is to make this particular superposition state of two magnetic sublevels amongst the 10. I'm showing you here, this is my target density matrix. This is the diagonal density, the diagonal uh, elements of the density matrix. These are the off diagonal elements of the density matrix. I'm just plotting the magnitude of those density matrix elements. This is the target state. And I want to, we optimize, here's what the phases look like as a function of time that does the job. So this is just an example that shows by optimal control, we can drive the system from that initial state to the final state. Optimal control gives us a solution that we would never ever intuit, but that does the job with an extremely high fidelity. Finally, what if we wanted to make that X gate, that gate which takes the system from some initial magnetic sublevel and shifted it to the sublevel plus one? Okay, so each one of these guys is shifted to plus one. What we need to make that happen is a waveform that simultaneously takes every one of those initial states and drives it to the final target state. So this is, we'll pause and relax to watch how each one of these states evolves. And isn't that magic? Right. So we think that this is really promising if we include spontaneous emission because we're using light to make that nonlinear effect, then we can get extremely high fidelity gates. Remember, these are 10 level systems. So we really, you know, thinking about a gate that has this high fidelity on a 10 level system, we really should think about taking something like the cube root of that to be able to understand what that would be in the relative uh, set of qubits. Because 10 levels, creating a gate with 10 levels, of course, is much harder than creating a gate with two levels. So this is something more like 
two nines of fidelity in equivalent qubit language. All right, I'm just going to leave up a couple of references for those of you who would want to view this in the future on YouTube. Uh, these are the works that describe some of the works that we've done in my group in collaboration with uh, others, my collaborators. And I want to then just thank very much uh, my collaborators on this work. In particular, I want to call out Anupam Mitra uh, and Shiva uh, Oma, Omakutan, who is um, the graduate students in my group who have done a tremendous amount of work, Anapam on the dressed Rydberg state gates and Shiva on the QDIT control. This work is done in collaboration as well with some of my good friends in the lab, Grant Biederman currently at University of Oklahoma, Mike Martin uh, on the Stranium project uh, in uh, now at LANL. Um, the efforts in quantum control are really pioneered uh, together with my good friend and, and longtime collaborator, Paul Yesen at the University of Arizona, and tremendous help from our postdoc and collaborator, Pablo Poggi. So I will uh, end there and take questions. And thank you again very much for your attention. Thank you, Ivan, for the, for the great talk. We do have uh, a, a, a good number of questions here I've been holding back on, um, maybe centered on two things, optimal control and neutral atoms. I'll start with the optimal control since that's where we just were. So I'll begin with one from Manuel. Um, if you can elaborate a bit on how the number of parameters for the optimal control um, relate with the number of, with the number of levels, I suppose, or number of qubits that you're interested in controlling and whether that's a non-issue or, or is something you need to be concerned about in, in right. running this. Um, okay. So um, it's an important question. We're controlling, it depends, the, the number of phase steps here depends on the number of free parameters we need to specify the task that we are trying to achieve. So in a state map, if my goal is to map myself from some initial state to some final state, then I have to specify the final state. If my final state is a pure state living in a d-dimensional Hilbert space, then it takes 2d minus 2 parameters to specify that state, right? Because it lives, it's a complex number. There are 2d real parameters. The overall phase is irrelevant. And then we have normalization. So for a qubit, for example, it takes two parameters the angles on a block sphere. For a 10 level system, it would take 20 parameters. Now that's a highly constrained set of parameters. So often in the optimal control, we, um, ha we give the system more steps to allow more flexibility for the numerics to find the right solution. And it's a bit of a trade-off as well. There's another point which I sloughed over completely, which is the total time that it takes. So the total time of this pulse sequence depends on what's called the quantum speed limit. Given a certain amount of energy or power in the system, there's only so fast I can get from any state to another state. So we fix the total time and then we fix the total number of steps within the constraint of the problem. Finally, if we wanted to make a gate, a gate is a unitary matrix. A gate has D squared uh, parameters. So for a D level system, that's a hundred steps, right? And that's what's uh, being shown here uh, in, 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 um, you know, this problem. And that's why there's a difference between the number of steps that it takes to prepare a given state versus the number of state steps it takes to make an individual gate. 
and uh, how much is known about how much can we say about the quantum speed limit? Is is there some pretty well understood bounds, or is this more of a general? Uh, yeah, so notion? this is a long this is a long studied problem. In fact, Pablo is uh, you know one of the world's experts on this. He's done his PhD thesis on this work. Um, in the if we have a static Hamiltonian, then there's a rigorous result. We know what the speed limit can be. In the if we have a time dependent Hamiltonian, as we do in these optimal control type problems, then we cannot analytically derive the speed limit. We can guesstimate what the speed limit is given the number of steps that we need in this piecewise constant approach, as well as, you know, so there's a kind of number of, you might say, mini pi pulses that we're doing. But what we do in practice is to empirically find the speed limit on the computer. You don't want to be on the hairy edge of the speed limit because then the control landscape for optimizing this becomes very poor. The fact that you don't get trapped in, in, in bad uh, suboptimal places is due to a benign landscape, which is better when you're a little bit farther from the hairy edge of the speed limit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, because if you have time dependent Hamiltonians, and, and you know, you could also, in principle, tune up your drives to you know near infinite power or something. So, you, so you need to bound. Uh, exactly. Yes, the speed power. limit depends is a function of the power. It's a function of the energy that you have. Mm -hmm. And uh, this was a general question from someone in the audience here, but uh, it's about gate speed. Uh, yeah. Qubits versus qubits. Um, yeah. I don't know if you have a comment on that. Um, well, you know, again, uh, you know, in general, a a uh, the the speed of the um, gate will depend on the dimension of the Hilbert space, right? The bigger the dimension of the Hilbert space. The, long, the longer it will take to do the gate. But if I had a qubit that was, say, an eight-dimensional qubit, I'm sorry, qubit, well, that's equivalent to three qubits. So one should compare the gate speed relative to the dimension of the Hilbert space and normalize it that way. So I should divide the gate speed for a D-level system by the log base two of D. Mm. To and make a fair comparison. I see. And uh, okay, this this is good. Um, and I suppose you know, in practice, when implementing these, you have to also worry about uh, the control and distortions in the control and so on. But we can maybe idealize that away for the time being, or the response of, of all the signals at different frequencies. Because I can almost think of, in the QDIT case, right, you say you have 10 levels. Um, you know, something more familiar to me is, say, the 10 levels of a superconducting anharmonic cavity, which, when there is a very large Kerr nonlinearity, uh, the sort of A dagger squared, A squared term, um, and when that nonlinearity is much larger than the dissipation of the cavity can be resolved, so you can in spectroscopy, if you want to see 10 different resolved individual levels that you can individually address with Robbie drives, uh, if you want, or just with one broadband drive. So you could shape that drive and, and try to do optimal control to create any arbitrary unitary in that space. So so I suppose that this is also quite applicable in, within that analogy as well. Um, Absolutely. I mean, in fact, as you know, uh, you know, similar work goes on in your alma mater at Yale in thinking about uh, the um, energy levels of a microwave cavity mm -hmm. in the presence of a, of a off resonant transmon. And, you know, doing 
gates there through optimal control. I mean, one in principle can make superpositions of any energy levels uh, in, in the um, combined system of the trans bond and the uh, harmonic levels of the single mode of the microwave cavity. And I think it's done in slow cost lab uh, in a similar way, not necessarily for qubits, but in principle could be done. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And uh, this has been done, I should mention, Paul Yesen's group, uh, you know, has done this with 16 levels to with, with microwave, combination of microwaves and RF with extremely high fidelities. Uh, and, you know, the, a point you made um, about the distortions in the waveform. Of course, you know, in order to make this work well, this is open loop control, meaning uh, we design something on the computer. And then what we're trying to say is what happens in the lab is exactly what's happening here in this movie. Uh, and that requires extremely good laboratory control to make what's going on in the lab what's going on in the computer. But one can, it turns out that it's reasonably robust to some small amount of imperfection, but one needs to be able to design in the right uh, robustness into the system. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thank you on that. And a question from Marcelo uh, here on the adiabatic passage. Could the results shown for the adiabatic passage benefit from shortcuts to adiabaticity via, for example, counter diabatic driving to accelerate the gates and improve their fidelities under noise? Yeah, it's a, it's a really good question. Um, it's something we can absolutely explore. So, you know, in this picture, um, this particular ramp uh, was chosen to be, it, as you can see, these small oscillations that are in these curves are a little bit of, of, of non-adiapaticity. These curves would not oscillate in this manner if we were perfectly adiabatic. Anupam uh, uh, optimized these gates to be as fast as possible uh, relative to the lifetime of the Rydberg state. We're, we're racing against that, um, but they are relatively adiabatic. Now, the question about non-adiabatic um, uh, shortcuts to adiapaticity my general feeling about that is, in principle, we can make the gates much faster that way. But the question we must ask ourselves is, what do we lose in the process? And what we lose is the potential robustness that we have through adiabatic uh, passage. That is to say, our ability to do the kind of spin echo effects that echoed out some of the inhomogeneity were tied in many ways to our near adiabatic ramps. So it's, it's a good question and one we haven't yet explored, which is kind of what is the optimal path that has the optimal trade-offs between robustness and speed? That's a good question. Um, and there was a question somewhat related to that uh, on fidelity, jumping back to optimal control here from the folks in the audience. Did, uh, if you notice the crucial effect on the resolution of the resolution of the pulses on the, con on the fidelity of the uh, unitary or the fidelity of creation of a target state? I mean, I obviously, you know, if you have too little uh, resolution in your control pulse, uh, then 
you have to push things harder and you're less robust and you, there's a breaking point. But uh, I think the question is what happens is you maybe increase that. Right. So, you know, it's one of the things that we discuss and argue about a lot within uh, the collaboration. So this is a fairly idealized waveform. As you notice, there are, you know, instantaneous jumps in the phase of the, you know, in what the phase is. This C here is the phase in units of pi. Obviously, the slew rate is not infinity, right? And there's a finite bandwidth. And so the actual, you know, if you place, put this waveform through some kind of, of filter that uh, then would give you, uh, we related to the response time of the coils of the controllers in the lab, then we're going to have a slightly different waveform that is uh, depending on what all those parameters are. And then we, you know, can ask how much does, you know, we can in principle then just run the time dependent Schrodinger equation and say, what is the evolution of the state under that filtered waveform compared to this idealized evolution? And this is something that we've done quite a bit with Paul's lab. And, you know, in the end, there's such a small fraction of the waveform that's happening in those short pulses that it doesn't change the fidelity much. But it is an important kind of design control uh, um, specification that we need to think about. Wonderful. And um, seeing as we're coming over 15 minutes here on the hour, maybe the last question from the audience. Um, this is a maybe an open-ended question for you, but uh, it was addressed to you. So how much of quantum computing is deterministic uh, versus stochastic? Ah, okay. Well, uh, I would say, you know, and I, so the way I would look at it is the following. Um, an ideal quantum algorithm is one in which the final register, the answer is deterministic, right? That is to say, you measure the qubits or the qubits, and you deterministically get the answer you want. But rarely do quantum algorithms work that way. I mean, even Shor's algorithm, the factors are not determined deterministically by the output of that algorithm. It comes out with high probability, and it's such that you're going to get a random result, but when you run the algorithm sufficiently number, few number of times, you can find the answer with high probability and then check, of course, because factoring is an NP problem. So um, I'd say that quantum computing is a combination of deterministic, deterministic gates deterministic evolution according to the Schrodinger equation with a little bit of randomness thrown in uh, in the ideal case. Of course, there are always random errors and the important aspect of making a quantum computer really work is that we can correct the, that part of the randomness that we really don't want. Mm. Well, thank you, Ivan, and I won't press you on uh, the character of quantum physics, objective <laughs> wave functions, and things like that. Uh, but instead, I'll open it up to you to see if there are any final comments, uh, thoughts you want to leave us with, or announcements uh, before we we thank the audience and thank you for being here. Great. Well, thank yeah, thanks for that. I guess there are a couple of things I I, I wanted to say, uh, and this is sort of relates to a perspective that I recently uh, wrote for uh, Physical Review X uh, Quantum, which is sort of how fundamental and curiosity-driven research is really hmm. at the foundation 
of mm. what ultimately becomes technology. Mm. Um, so, you know, uh, let me just uh, go back here to uh, just as one example. So why was it that, you know, a few months really, at, this was November 94 when this paper was received in, at the Physical Review. I don't know when Shore uh, um, released his paper, but it was sometime in 1994. Mm. So why was it that just a few months after Sirac and Zoller were able to do that? Well, you know, the point was at the time, uh, Sirac and Zoller, you know, they act, Sirac was a, actually a professor at, at Jilla in Boulder at CU and, you know, worked with Dave Wineland and they were thinking about quantum control of atomic ions and making cat states. Part of that was, you know, they were building up these tools for metrology uh, in, of course, in the time and frequency division where Wineland led for many decades. Uh, and, um, you know, they were just curious about quantum mechanics. And they had those tools in, in thinking about the ability to control quantum systems. It wasn't about quantum computing at all. No, I can say, you know, no, nobody knew anything about quantum computing uh, except, the, you know, this, this small priesthood of people that no one knew about in the 80s. Um, and so uh, that kind of wanting just to understand fundamental science and developing the tools in the lab to probe that fundamental science, even though those tools maybe weren't going to tell us about changes to the standard model of high energy physics, but they were going to help us to understand quantum mechanics itself hmm. uh, um, allowed the groups in AMO physics and quantum optics to jump on this from the get-go. And so I think one of the lessons and messages that I want to share with the community here is how important curiosity-driven research is. And you never, you absolutely just never ever know where that basic research is going to take us and how important it is going to be for the technologies of the future. I couldn't agree more. It's it, that fundamental basic science is the trunk of the tree on which, which bears fruits uh, of technology, uh, to put it another way. So thank you for that uh, inspiring message uh, to close us off with. Thank you everyone for tuning into the seminar and for the many questions. And uh, most of all, thank you, Ivan, for uh, being our great speaker today and accepting our invitation. And so I'd like to thank everyone. And I'd like to thank you, Ivan, for uh, this episode of the Kiskit Live Seminar Series and for the great talk. Thank you all very much. And those of you who are interested, please uh, join us at sequic.unm.edu. Uh, uh, and um, we hope to see you there. Awesome. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Ivan. And we'll see you next week, Friday at noon Eastern time.